Morning, Trainiacs. Half Ironman World Championship weekend was unreal. Gracie's excited about it. I was excited about it. I could not take myself away from the Iron Man Now live feed. There are so many storylines that came out from both the men's and the women's side. We're gonna go through five of what I think are the biggest storylines on both the men's and the women's side. Whew. It's intense. <laughs> So let's get right into it and start off by congratulating our champions. Five time champion, Daniela Reef. Well, if anyone had said ahead of time that anyone but Daniela Reef was, Pete, did you pick Daniela Reef? Everyone should have picked Daniela Reef because until anyone proves that they can beat her, she remains the queen of long course racing. She is so dominant that this was not a surprise at all. So congratulations to her. Over here, oh, there, there. What was a surprise was the men's champion, Gustav Eden. It was such a surprise that they had to ask how they pronounced his name on the podium. Now Gustav Eden, he is not really a total like unknown. It's just a surprise because he's so young and he hasn't raced a lot. So he's ranked 10th in the world in the ITU world rankings and his most recent races being a fourth at the grand final ITU championship and a fourth at the Tokyo test event proves that he is that elite caliber kind of racer. He just has never shown it because he's so young. Real fun fact about that is that as he was on the bike course, everyone was saying this is a real interesting tactic that Gustav Eden has chosen to use a road bike instead of a tri bike. Well, he said afterwards in an interview that that's the only bike he has because he doesn't have any sponsors. That's how new Gustav Eden is. I imagine he's going to be getting some extra bikes pretty soon. Now onto the women's race. I think that some of the biggest headlines are number one, Lucy Charles getting a drafting penalty. And I think why this is so interesting is watching all the footage after she received that drafting penalty, I would say that of everyone, she was probably the tightest into Daniela Reef's wheel. But as her husband and coach, Reese Barkley said in a post that he did on Instagram, these penalties are so severe that they need to be enforced equally across the board. And it's not like Lucy was completely drafting while other people were obeying the rules. It's more like it was a really technical bike course where just with the changes in the road, the changes in the elevation and terrain, it's hard to stay completely off of people's wheels, especially when the rule was that you could not even pass over the center line. So between the drafting rules, the no crossing over the center line rule, there are gonna be a lot of bunches of riders going around. So super unfortunate that our pal Lucy ended up suffering that, but she still put out a good race and frankly, it'll probably leave her a little bit fresher for Kona. One incredible story from Another unfortunate standpoint was Ellie Salthaus. Now Ellie ended up having a mechanical issue that forced her to end up riding in just one gear for the entire bike ride. Now, if we took Ellie's bike time and just made it kind of an average of what the podium bike times were, and I've been told that Ellie is a phenomenal descender, so it's very realistic that she could have done that, her time was actually a second place finish overall. Granted, we don't know if she was mashing gears and toasting her legs on the bike or if she was spinning a really easy gear and leaving her legs fairly fresh on the run so her run was a bit of an overperformance. But in either case, it was a pretty drastic time difference between her and the front pack. And then she went and dropped an amazing run which came after an amazing swim. So really unfortunate that that happened and it would have been interesting to see Reef, Holly Lawrence, Lucy Charles, Ellie Salthouse all beating the tar out of each other for the entire run. 
On that note, another storyline is that Holly Lawrence is 100% back. Now, Holly has been back from the injury that she suffered about a year and a half ago after competing in Oceanside 70.3 that her doctors were saying she might never return to elite racing again. Well, she is back and she's been back for a while, winning a lot of races around that four hour mark, but rumors around from other people. I didn't buy into this because I thought that she was 100% back, but everyone was saying mentally, is she back mentally and can she compete with the best in the world? Well, we saw this weekend that she definitely can. She's back and I want to, I want to see th that was just slugging it out elbow to elbow in the race. And finally, it was the year of the breakout. There were four athletes that I think had real serious overperformances that I believe they were capable of, but they actually delivered on the day. Imogen Simmons getting on the podium, Chelsea Sidaro running her way into fourth place, Menon Gannett and Amelia Watkinson getting into top tens. These are women that are establishing themselves as young, potential future candidates to be world champions. So congratulations to everyone in the top 10. Great race. On the men's side, I think one of the interesting things of note was Alistair Brownlee not winning. Now what Alistair said after the race is that he got about 5k into the run and he just didn't have it. His legs didn't have it even though he felt good coming off the bike. Thanks, bud. This is kind of strange coming from Alistair because normally if I've ever seen Alistair step up to a start line, he never holds back. It's full gas right from the start to the finish. If we compare his run from last year in Worlds where he placed second to this year in Worlds where he placed second, the effort level is completely different. It's about a three minute slower run that he did this year in Worlds and the course was easier than last year. So this is a really, really easy run effort that Alistair put out. Is this because he raced too many times recently, qualifying for Kona at Ironman Cork, then recently doing a half Ironman just two weeks ago in Ireland, and then having Kona coming up? So is he holding back? Is he tired? We don't really know, but it was just really unexpected. If you listen to the commentary in Facebook Live, they were basically announcing Alistair as the winner coming into T2, which we did not see. I'm gonna be interested to see how this plays out come Kona. Next, Rudy Von Berg, huge performance, huge congratulations. I don't wanna take all the credit, but we have had Rudy on the podcast talking about the course and we tend to send people off after the podcast to have really good seasons. So, I mean, probably like 80, 20, 80%, Thanks to Rudy, 20% thanks to us. I mean, whatever, we can split up the prize money however you like. But at 25 years old, placing third on the podium on home soil, this is a huge performance. Rudy's establishing himself as one of the best triathletes in the world and he's one of, well, it's actually a growing list, of the few triathletes that have actually towed the line, gone side to side with Javier Gomez and won. Now, speaking of Javier Gomez, he had another underperformance. During this week, Javier said that after the Olympics next year, he is going to refocus on long course racing and set his sights on Kona. What we're seeing from Javier is that as he returned to short course racing, he wasn't the athlete that was dominant as he used to be. He's now also showing chinks in the armor, stepping up to Kona last year, not having a good performance, stepping it up to half Ironman Worlds this year, not having a good performance. So the clock is ticking on somebody who I think and thought for years could be one of the best Ironman athletes ever and he's not able to show that. Is it age? Is it nutrition? Is it adapting to the different systems of long course racing versus short course racing? I'd like to see him do really well, but we're not seeing it. And one of those athletes who people have been saying similar things to what we've heard about Javier that, you know, maybe the best years are behind him, Sebastian Keenly. Well, Sebastian Keenly came to play, placing fifth overall, and more importantly, putting out the second fastest runtime overall, outrunning Alistair Brownlee, Javier Gomez, 
Rudy Von Berg, everyone but the eventual winner. Now, this is showing that somebody who isn't known for their run, is stronger on the bike, might be showing up to Kona better prepared than they have ever been since winning Kona in 2014. It's been a long time since we've seen Sebastian put out run times that he's doing right now. And if he shows up to Kona with this kind of run talent paired with his bike talent, if he ends up having a good swim, he could be the favorite there. One of the athletes who didn't look good that you'd hope would be one of the favorites in Kona was Patrick Lange. Now, Patrick had a fairly subpar swim. Now, it was a very hard swim. It was a very fast swim, but he was out of the water around 20th, 21st. But he posted on Instagram that this course showed his weakness. He didn't specify what that weakness was. I assume that he's talking about his bike because he had the 31st fastest bike overall. His run was pretty average, but in the end, he was way down in the field. Now, when we had Patrick on the Triathlon Terran podcast, he says two things, and I don't know which one to focus on. One of those things is that he said, if you believe you can win Kona, you have to do everything to win Kona. Now, in my mind, that means that it's not out of the realm of possibility for somebody to be holding back in a race five weeks out of Kona. We saw that Jan Ferdino, Alistair Brownlee, Javier Gomez all got shattered by going so deep into the well at last year's Half Ironman World that maybe that's what's on Patrick's mind and it's holding him back at this year's Half Ironman World. The other thing that Patrick said on the podcast was that I speculate, and like literally me, that he's heard how I've speculated that maybe he's holding back throughout the year to prepare himself for Kona and that's not the case. Which one is true? I don't know, but what keeps happening every single year, Patrick, is that we have performances from you all throughout the year that make people think that you aren't performing very well, you're not ready for Kona, and then you go and break records. So are you gonna be a favorite in Kona? Absolutely, nobody in the history of Kona has gone as fast and been, I would say, as dominant, looking as strong in the heat of Kona and the challenge of Kona as you have. But geez, man, you're giving me nothing to work with here. Holy gee, smokes, this is tough. Also, he likes dogs. Patrick's a fan of dogs, so he's cool with us. So that's it, Trainiacs. That is Half Ironman World Championships 2019. It was incredibly exciting. Every single year, the field gets tougher and tougher, and I'm loving watching this. It's legitimately one of the most competitive races out there every single year because there are so many athletes from ITU stepping up to Half Ironman Worlds, as we saw with Gustav Eden. There are so many of the best in the world coming from Ironman, stepping down to Half Ironman Worlds, as we saw with Sebastian Keenley, Patrick Lange. The best of the best are seeming to congregate in Half Ironman Worlds, and it's fun to watch. So congratulations to all the winners. Congratulations to all the finishers, the age groupers out there. I hear it was a fantastic course and a great year. Congrats. I hope everyone had fun. Make sure you hit the subscribe button to watch our coverage of Kona because we're actually going to be there.